If I were to ask each of you to identify a single event that permanently changed your life, I think we'd have a lot of interesting responses. I think a number of you would uh, might point to a very positive thing in your life, like marriage. And if you're, if you're married, uh, and uh, ladies, if your spouse is here today, look over at your spouse and say, you made a good choice. <laughs> and gentlemen, your response is, thank you. <laughs> yes, I did. You know, but marriage isn't the only thing that can change life. There's a lot of different uh, things and choices, decisions that we make that can change someone's life. You look at uh, things like uh, career choices or uh, where you want to live, uh, buying the house, you know, that turns into a money pit. That can, that can be a, a negative thing. You know, some of you might be thinking when I ask the question about a single event that may have changed your entire life, you might think of something negative like that, you know, and you might sort of feel like that old Indiana Jones movie where the, uh, the old knight is sitting next to all the chalices and uh, one of them uh, made a mistake and the old knight said he chose poorly. And you might think that about your whole life. Oh no, I've chosen poorly. What have I done? You know, but we all encounter life-changing events from time to time, don't we? And sometimes we don't even know that the thing that we're, uh, that the decision that we're engaged in might change the entire course of our lives. But sometimes we, get, we have an idea. I mean, you get out of high school, you've got some choices, don't you? What are you going to do next? Are you going to go to college? Are you going to uh, study a certain thing here or there? There's, there's choices there to make. Are you going to uh, maybe not go to college, but get a job, enter the workforce? And if so, what are you going to do? For some of you all here, after you got out of high school, you went into the armed forces. Maybe you had that recruiter tell you that uh, you can go anywhere you want, live anywhere you want, and do whatever you want to do, and retire in 20 years. And you believed them. Well, good. You know, but we all make different choices, and every choice we make, whether it's like out of high school, going to college, or getting a job, or joining the armed forces, or deciding to live in your mother's basement and play video games, whatever choice you might make, there are consequences to those decisions. And this is simply true of life. Whatever it is you want to do, no matter what path you choose, things can end up being a life-changing event. Well, I used to teach high school economics, and there was a, vo a vocabulary term that I wanted all of my high school economics students to know. And it was this term because it applied not only to economics but to life. It was the term opportunity cost. Opportunity cost. The idea is this. If a business or a company, let's say, is able to make either airplanes or cars, it must choose one to the detriment of the other, if it cannot do both. And so, perhaps to make one airplane, it would take the same amount of resources that it would to make 100 cars. And so, if that company decided to make the one airplane, the opportunity cost would be 100 cars. That's what they've lost. They've lost the opportunity to make 100 cars by deciding to make one airplane. Well, in life, life is very much like that. If, for example, you spend your time and your money playing video games in your mom's basement, that is time and money that you could have spent investing in yourself in different ways or investing in life in different ways. There is, to every decision you make, an opportunity cost. And this is especially true of life-changing events. Well, I want to submit an idea for your consideration that a life-changing event happened 2,000 years ago when Christ died on the cross. This is obviously before you or I were even uh, born or even considered. This happened to be a life-changing event when Jesus died on the cross and the life that was changed is yours. The life that's changed is mine. And today we've come to the end of this 10-week series called The Cross. And up to now we've looked extensively at what Jesus did on the cross and how that connects to us. And most of the things that we've discovered about how, what Jesus did on the cross and how it connects to us is this, that it opened up 
an entryway. It opened up a doorway for you and I to enter God's kingdom, to, for, for us to be a part of God's family. When we typically think about the cross, we think about things like this, that Jesus paid the penalty that we owed through the cross. We think about how, how through the cross, Jesus was our substitute. How through the cross, Jesus covered our sins. Through the cross, Jesus became our sacrifice, or the sacrifice that was necessary to redeem us. And so in all of these different ways, however you want to look at it, whatever analogy or picture you want to use, we've discovered that the cross is the entryway into God's kingdom. It's the, it's the pathway to God. It's the only pathway to God, in fact. And so we have a door that's been opened to us to, for, for we can be a part of God's kingdom and God's family. Here's the question that I have for you today. Did Jesus' death on the cross only punch our ticket into God's kingdom? Is that all it did? Or is there some way in which the cross can benefit us daily? I mean, we're already in God's kingdom. If you're a believer, you're already part, a member of God's family, aren't you? And so what now? Now that I've been saved, now that I've entered through that door, now that I've responded in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, what impact does the cross really have on my life now on a daily basis? How does it continue to benefit me? Think of it this way. Let's say you really want to go to a party. And somehow you, you finagled your way in and you got, you got into the party. And you're in the party. Well, what's the point of trying to focus all of your time on how to get into the party? You're already in. And so my question for you today is, now as Christians, we're already in to God's kingdom. Why focus on the cross? What benefit does it have for us today? What's the point of the cross now in my life? Well, the idea that I want to submit to your, for your consideration is that the cross was not only an event that got us into God's kingdom, but it is something that can bless your life every day. And I want to show you how. You see, the cross is not simply something that happened that benefits you on the day that you got saved, however long or short ago that was. But there are daily blessings when you and I learn to live under the cross. Now, live under the cross. What does that mean? I mean, that's the name of this sermon. Life under the cross is the name of this sermon. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like Christian code. That's what that sounds like. That sounds like a, a nice Christian thing, sort of religious gobbledygook, religious mumbo-jumbo that doesn't really have any meaning, but it's something you say in church and people say amen, and they don't even know what they're saying amen to. And I know no, no one would ever do that. But what does that mean, living under the cross. Well, here's what it means very succinctly. It means that the death of Jesus on the cross governs our behavior, it dominates our perspective, and it even colors our relationships. It means that the cross is an ever-present idea in our lives that has the possibility of changing everything. Let's take relationships, for example, because I think we can most clearly see this. Now, when you and I get saved, when we come under the influence of the cross, we're saved, we're bought by his blood, however you want to think about that. It changes the way we view people, doesn't it? We begin to see everyone either as them also being saved by the cross or them needing salvation. We see people this way as Christians. Christians fall into one of, or people fall into one of two categories in our mind. They're either saved or they need to be. We wish they were. And, and the Bible, in fact, instructs us 
to treat unbelievers differently than believers. The Bible tells us not to yoke ourselves with unbelievers. Why? Because it will drag us down spiritually. It will draw us away from God. So we don't yoke ourselves with unbelievers. The Bible tells us that it's our responsibility to help unbelievers come to the cross, come to faith in Christ. But we don't treat believers that way. They've already come to the cross, right? And so there are ways in which we treat unbelievers a little bit differently than we treat believers. Why? Because we have a different view of them. But as far as believers go, if someone else is a believer, well, you and I know that we have certain responsibilities toward them. If someone else has encountered the cross, they've been saved by Jesus' death on the cross, well, the Bible instructs us to love them. The Bible instructs us to bear their burdens. The Bible instructs us to meet their needs, and so on and so forth. And so we have a special relationship with those who have also decided to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the cross should impact every part of our experience as humans. Not just our relationships, but as I mentioned, it should dominate our perspective. It should govern our behavior. You know, there's coming a day as Christians when we're going to praise Jesus like never before. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, this is the 24 elders in heaven singing this or, or shouting this praise to God. They say, our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you have created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So do you get it? You and I are going to be in heaven. We'll see the 24 elders. They'll be giving praise to God because he is the creator of all things. And then in the very next chapter, in chapter 5 of Revelation, verse 12, this is you and me. This is us giving praise to Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb. And we're giving praise not only because he is the creator, but for something else as well. They said with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb who is slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. There's coming a day, Christian, when you and I, unfiltered, will be able to worship the Lord Jesus Christ for that incredible event of what he did for us on the cross. And he will forever be worthy of our praise because of that life-changing event that happened so long ago. Now, today, Christian, the way you live your life right now is practice for eternity. And we are to be people of praise. We are to be people who value the cross. If the people of heaven are going to value the cross. Shouldn't we today value the cross as well? And if you don't value the cross, I think that day when you are in the very presence of the one who died on the cross, it's going to come as quite a shock to your system. We need to learn to value what Jesus did on the cross for us every single day. In our regular day-to-day -day lives, the cross should impact how we experience God. And I would say that it already has, Christian. The cross has already impacted how you experience God. What do I mean? I mean that your experience with God now is different than your experience with God before you knew him. Your experience with God as a Christian, as a believer, is different than, your, than someone who's not a believer. How they experience God. And it's changed our experience with God. The cross has changed our experience of God in at least three ways. First of all, the cross enables us to relate to God through love. Through love. What do I mean? Well, it's simply this. As a Christian, you love God. It's that simple. As a Christian, you love God. You just love Him. You do. You love God just as real as you love your spouse. As a Christian, you love God just as real as you love your kids or your grandkids. 
Your love for God is exactly that real. But, but as an unbeliever, someone who's an unbeliever, well, that person either hates God, there are some unbelievers that just hate God, or they don't believe that there is a God. There are some unbelievers like that. There are some unbelievers that they think that God exists, but they don't really trust Him. They think He's got some bad intentions. Or there are some believers who they, they think that He exists, but, but they're just not too sure about God, the, this idea of a God. Just not too sure about it. Or at the very best, they're unbelievers that like the idea of God. They like the idea of God being loving toward them. They like that. But he's very distant. They don't know him. They don't really know him. But you know what? You're a believer now. As a believer, God is not distant. At least he shouldn't be that way. God is as close to you as a prayer. As a believer, God, the Holy Spirit, lives in you. And like I said, you love Him. You love God just as much, or just as realistically at least, as you love your spouse, your kids, your grandkids, your friends, your loved ones. You know, if someone says something hurtful about God, if someone says something untrue about God, it bothers you, doesn't it, Christian? It hurts you. Why? Because they're saying something hurtful or untrue about someone that you love. And you don't like it when they do that. You know, one of the truest signs, one of the surest signs that someone is saved is that they love God. They just love God. Why do we love God? 1 John 4 tells us why. There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears is not complete in love. We love because he first loved us. How do we know God loves us? Because Christ died on the cross for us. It's that simple. The cross makes it possible for you and me every single day to love God. The cross changes our relationship with God in a second way. With boldness. Boldness. Now I would say that there's hardly a believer that, uh, an unbeliever that has ever lived who came boldly before God in prayer. In fact, most unbelievers don't know what to pray for, much less be bold in doing so. But you know what? As a believer, do you hesitate to pray? No. You don't hesitate to pray. You can pray any time, can't you? You can boldly go before the king of the universe, with your requests. You can boldly come to God. Ephesians 3 says, In Him we have boldness and confident access through faith in Him. Hebrews 4, 16 says, Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. I don't know about you, but I think I need mercy every day. I need grace every day. I need a measure of God's grace every day. And every single day, I can come to my Father and ask Him for help. Ask Him for help. This week, I was uh, sitting next to a couple of pastors at a dinner, and uh, we were somehow got on the topic of uh, our kids growing up and leaving the house, and especially our daughters getting married. And uh, this one pastor I was speaking with said, you know, the worst thing about your daughter growing up and getting married? I said, what's that? 
He said, she doesn't need me anymore. And I thought, wow. And he went on and on about him needing to be needed by his kids. Now, we are the children of our Father in heaven. And at any time, in any circumstance, we can boldly go before the king of the whole universe and say, Father, I need help. I need you. And there are times when God will move heaven and earth. Why? Because dads, that's what you would do for your kids too. God loves to hear us. Come, request mercy and grace to help in time of need. Unbelievers don't get that. They don't understand it. But we do. We can come boldly before God. The cross also makes it possible for us to experience God with joy. To experience God with joy. If you are redeemed, you ought to have joy in your life. Even if it's a bad day. I mean a really bad day. And bad circumstances can happen to anyone. But deep down, in our heart of hearts, there ought to be a remnant, a seed of joy. Because we've got something deep down that circumstances cannot take away. In the Hebrew Scriptures, we read about, in Psalm 126, the the Jews that returned from captivity in Babylon and how, how grateful they were. And it says, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Our mouths were filled with laughter then, and our tongues with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord had done great things for us. We were joyful. Christian, if you've somehow lost your joy, you need to go back and think about all the things that God has done for you. You need to go back and think about the cross and have your joy restored. Unbelievers, they don't experience our joy. They don't know. Lost people don't know what it's, what it's like to be found after being lost. What it's like to see after being blind. They don't know what it's like to be alive after being dead. They only know what it's like to be lost and blind and dead, and they think that's normal. That's why they think you're crazy. Because God has found you. He's made you see things that you could not see before. And he's made you alive. Even people that worship other religions don't have the same joy that we do. All you have to do is look at the songs they sing, or the lack of songs they sing. Singing joyous songs is something that only Christians do. Think about Buddhists. What do Buddhists do? They chant. There's no joy in that. Muslims, they will on occasion cite verses of the Quran in a melodious manner, but they're not the jubilant songs of the forgiven. Typically, the music of Islam speaks of submission. It speaks of request. Rarely does it ever rise to the level of thanksgiving. Singing joyful songs is the common Christian experience anywhere you go in the world. You could walk right now into an underground church in China, and they will be singing joyful songs. And you in your heart, not knowing an ounce of Chinese or Mandarin, you would be able to sing along with them because of the joy that they exude. Why is it that Christians sing all the time? Why do we have Christian radio stations that play Christian music, praise music? But there, there, are no other, there are no atheist songs out there. Why is that? Because we've got something to sing about. You know, the only forgiveness that Muslims, for example, know is the forgiveness that they think is earned from Allah. And for them, that forgiveness is dubious at best. They have no guarantee. It's not a certain thing. 
But we as Christians, we sing of God's forgiveness because it is a free gift bestowed on all who respond in faith to what Jesus did on the cross. We have joy. We have joy. The cross makes our daily fellowship with God to be characterized by love, by boldness, and by joy. And the cross also transforms our self-understanding, how we view ourselves. You know, I've come, a lot, I've come across a lot of Christians that have a terrible, terrible view of themselves. They despise themselves. They hate themselves. And I've come a lot, across a lot of Christians that have uh, too much of a love for themselves. They are the greatest thing ever. And if you don't believe them, ask. They'll tell you. How should we view ourselves as Christians? Well, let's begin here. Mark eight thirty four. Jesus said, If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself. And take up his cross and follow me. Take up his cross. What does that mean? Well, I think there's a lot of of people that are confused about what it means to take up your cross. You hear some people say they've got some kind of struggle going on in their life. And they say something like, well, that's just the cross I have to bear. Cantankerous spouse, well, that's just the cross I have to bear. In debt up to your eyeballs, well, that's the cross I have to bear. Indigestion, that's the cross I have to bear. But somehow, I'm pretty sure that when Jesus talked about taking up your cross, he didn't mean indigestion. And that's, you can quote me on that, share that with your friends, tell them how brilliant your preacher is. (laughs) Back in that day, crucifixion meant death. And if you saw a man carrying his cross, it means he was a dead man walking. He was on his way to his own execution. And he was carrying the very instrument that would carry out his execution. A person carrying their cross was a person condemned. To carry your cross means death. Not indigestion. Not even a cantankerous spouse. It means death. So what kind of death? Well, the Bible talks about three kinds of death. The Apostle Paul specifically mentions three different kinds of death. The first kind of death is death to sin. Death to sin occurs when you have faith in Christ. In other words, at the moment of your salvation, you have died to sin. When you came to faith in Christ, you experienced this kind of death. You died to sin and you've been raised to a new life in Christ and baptism pictures Death to sin and resurrection to life in Christ. The second kind of death is what Jesus means in this passage that we just read about in Mark chapter 8. It is the death to self. This occurs daily. As you deny your selfish desires and as you yield to God, this is taking up your cross on a daily basis. We should die to ourselves every day. How do you do this? By consciously Deciding every day to put yourself aside and to put Christ first. When we die to self, we live a life of sweet fellowship with God that day. We yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit. We become filled with the Holy Spirit. This is what is meant to die to self. The third kind of death is very obvious. It's the death of our bodies. And this obviously occurs at your physical death. But just as sure as when we die to our sin, we're raised, and just as sure as when we die to ourself, we have a new sweet fellowship, we're raised, if you will, to a sweet fellowship with God that day. When we die physically, there's coming a day, we can be sure of it, that we will be raised from the dead physically with a glorified body. And so when Jesus talked about dying yourself, dying to yourself, taking up your cross daily, following him, denying yourself. He was referring to the second kind of death that Paul mentioned. So is that how we should view ourselves? We're just sort of a, I don't know, selfish, terrible individuals who live in a state of self-denial? Well, not exactly. That's not the entire view of the human experience. To be sure, there is a dark side to every single person's nature. This is the part of you 
that makes bad decisions. It's the part of you that gets yourself into trouble. It's the part of you that makes yourself miserable. But that's not all that there is to you. There is also an incredible, a beautiful, a wonderful, a magnificent side of you. This is the part of you that God created. This is you. In his image. You see, when the Bible talks about the human condition, it tells us the truth. The Bible talks about us being complete, holistic. It gives us an honest assessment of our constitution as humans. The Bible tells us that we are made in God's image, but we are fallen. The Bible tells us that we are physical, but we are also spiritual. The Bible says that we live in this present age of darkness, but we also, as through faith in Christ, Live in the kingdom of God. The nature of humanity in the Bible is the same nature that you and I experience every day. It's the one that we know for sure that goes on in our heart. That there is a battle between good and evil going on in us. And we make choices. Some good, some not. The New Testament, Christian would have you affirm what is good and deny what is evil. When you and I learn to live under the cross, we will engage not only in Jesus' call to self-denial of that which is bad, but we will also engage in self-affirmation of what God has created in us. Now you might wonder, how can we both deny self and affirm self at the same time. Well, it's like this. The part of yourself that you are to deny is the result of sin. And the part of yourself that you are to affirm is part of God's creation. Theologian and Pastor John Stott put it this way. So then, whatever we are by creation, we must affirm. Our rationality, our sense of moral obligation... Our sexuality, whether masculine or feminine, our family life, our gifts of aesthetic appreciation and artistic creativity, our stewardship of the fruitful earth, our hunger for love and experience of community, our awareness of the transcendent majesty of God, and our inbuilt urge to fall down and worship Him. Whatever we are by the fall, and by the fall He means because of sin entering our lives and entering this world. Whatever we are by the fall, however, we must deny and repudiate our irrationality, our moral perversity, our blurring of sexual distinctives, and our lack of sexual self-control, the selfishness which spoils our family life, our lazy refusal to develop God's gifts, our pollution and spoilation of the environment, the antisocial tendencies which inhibit true community, our proud autonomy, and our idolatrous refusal to worship the living and true God. Do you get it? Affirm how God created you to be. Whether that's tall, short, whether it's white skin, black skin, brown skin, it's all beautiful in God's sight. The color of your hair, your abundance of hair, the lack of abundance of hair. The way you look is a gift from God. Your intelligence, your abilities, so on and so on. All, those, all of these things are gifts of God via creation. And if it is a gift of God, it is therefore sacred. It is holy. Affirm those things. Deny the things that are base in nature, sinful in nature, the things that bring harm to your life, the things even within you to bring harm. But here's the amazing thing about being in Jesus Christ. Not only can we affirm how God created us to be, but we can also affirm 
who we are in Christ. Because Christian, you need to realize that not only are you created in God's image as a human, but you are recreated into His image. When God saves us, He doesn't just lift us back up to the level that Adam was before the fall. God glorifies us. He raises us to a higher state than Adam ever experienced. In 2 Corinthians 1, the Bible tells us, Christian, that you have been established. You've been anointed. You've been sealed by God. Ephesians 2, you are God's workmanship. 2 Timothy 1, you have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, a sound mind. 2 Corinthians 5 says that you are a minister of reconciliation for God. 1 Corinthians 6 says that you have been bought with a price and you belong to God. Ephesians 1 says that you've been chosen by God. You've been adopted into His family. Romans 5 says that you have been justified. 1 Corinthians 12 says you are a member of Christ's body. Colossians 2 says that you are complete in Christ. Romans 8 says that you are free from condemnation. John 15 says you are a branch of Jesus Christ, the true vine. You are a channel of His life. Hebrews 4 says that you have direct access to the throne of grace through Jesus Christ. Colossians 3 says that you are hidden with Christ in God. 1 Corinthians 3 says that you are God's temple. 1 Corinthians 6 says that you are united with the Lord. You are one with Him in spirit. John 15 says that you are a friend of Jesus Christ. 1 John 5, you are born of God. The evil one cannot touch you. John 15, you've been chosen. You've been appointed to bear fruit. Ephesians 2, you are seated with Jesus Christ in the heavenly realm. Romans 8 says that you can be assured that God works everything for your good in all circumstances. Colossians 1 says you have been redeemed. You have been forgiven of all of your sins. Philippians 3 says that you are a citizen of heaven. Romans 8 says you cannot be separated from the love of God. Philippians 1 says that you can be confident that God will complete the work that He has began in you. John 1 says that you are God's child. Ephesians 3 says you can approach God with freedom and with confidence. And Philippians 4 says that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Do you understand? Who you are in Christ. You are all these things. You can affirm all these things. Christian, listen carefully to me. You are not a loser. Christian, you are not worthless. You are not insignificant. Don't ever believe the lie that says you're any of those things. You are who God says you are. You are a child of the king. That makes you royalty. You are a prince. You are a princess. And if you are a prince, if you are a princess of the king of kings, live like it. Deny those things. That are beneath you. Your heavenly father says the truth is so much more. 